So anytime there's an engineer involved in giving a presentation, your biggest fear is that it's going to be very detailed and very boring. And I'm going to try to um, not get into all the little nitty-gritty details, but do kind of a broad um, brush, big uh, high-level scope of what is electrical engineering design, what things do you guys need to kind of be thinking about. We're going to kind of run through five things. Why, why is uh, engineering in general important on your projects, specifically electrical? Um, keys to a successful project. What elements or what components are part of the electrical design? Uh, what to expect from your contractor once you hand the design off to them? What should you be expecting from them? And then how do we ensure that the job gets done according to the design? So as the owner, we heard this from the panel yesterday, um, that these projects are getting bigger, they're getting more sophisticated, and it's getting tougher for you to be the expert on everything that's involved in a construction project. So you need to surround yourselves with professionals that can come alongside you and make that project successful. Um, three main things that we're thinking about here, the reasons why you want to do that, we need to uh, maximize your personnel safety, right? Safety has become a big issue. We want to minimize your business liability. You guys buy and sell grain and, and you can manage that risk, but you don't want to have to worry about risk in the construction side of it if you don't have to. You can't afford delays um, and the local permitting process might require you to have some design done. So first off, we want to maximize your safety. And I just threw up a couple funny pictures there. But safety has is, is got to be in your culture. And it can't just be um, something you talk about. The guy up in the left-hand corner, right, he's mounting the safety sign. He's standing, straddling the handrails on a stairwell. He hasn't really bought into their safety program. Um, you need to prepare yourself for the hazards that may exist. So the mouse has the helmet on, he's ready to go for it. He's going to be just fine. Can't afford delays. Um, you guys buy and sell grain, and, and you guys are experts in that. A lot of times when we start a project, you already have a deadline of when you're going to be soaring that prod product that's coming in and when you're going to sell it. And the engineers and the contractors need to really understand how big a deal that is. These commodities are bought and sold you know, a year ahead of time or whatever. You're hedging, you're doing your options and your whatever. I'm not a commodities guy. But it's very important and you can't afford delays. We need to understand that. Um, I've used this picture before. Um, the local building code might require you to do some engineering design this engineer, he was all over the code. The code said, per your occupant load of whatever, 50 people, you need two plumbing fixtures to meet the code. So he put two urinals there and uh, met the code. And I challenge any two of you to try to make that work. Uh, when you start a project, we need to think about how we're going to um, attack that all the way from the design, how we're going to build it. And there's really two different approaches, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there's design bid, build. So design it, then bid it, and then build it. Or there's design build. And we get asked a lot of, a lot of times, which one's better, or which one should we do, or it, it depends is the answer. If you've got a contractor that you're very comfortable with, they've done your work for years and years and you trust them, design build is a good option. Um, but just because you have a contractor that you've worked with for years, don't shy away from the design part, right? That contractor in most cases will, will be, um, he will welcome a design team that can come alongside of him and make the project successful. If you have, <coughs> A situation where you have a bunch of contractors, some of which might even be patrons to your co-op or whatever, and you don't want to hurt feelings, maybe a design bid format is better. So you put a package together and you bid it out and you go with the, 
the lowest price or whatever your criteria is. We want to establish a clear scope of work. Um, we heard the panel talk about this yesterday. So many times the, the issues on projects are not um, that complicated, but it boils down to scope of work. What are you guys expecting? You know, maybe you, you called your contractor and said, I want to do a grain expansion. This happens to be a local co-op um, that I took a picture of. I want to do a grain expansion. You're, you're picturing something like this, like a million and a half bushels. And your contractor bid a $5,000 butler bin, right? That's an extreme, but making sure everybody's on the same page and your expectations match up is very important. Making sure your engineer understands what you expect out of design is very important. Define the roles of all the players involved. Um, in the industry, um, there's this, there's, I, I guess it's a fallacy in my mind because it doesn't have to be this way, but there's this idea that contractors hate engineers, engineers hate contractors, and oh my gosh, I'm not going to hire both because all they're going to do is fight, and they're going to yell, and it's going to make it complicated. That, that is changing, um, and it needs to change. You're the owner. You're the boss. You hire a contractor, you hire an engineer, tell them to play together, right? Work together and make the project successful. All we run into um, when, there's, when there's yelling and, and disputes is high-level frustration, the project does, is not going to be a successful one. This is kind of people's opinion of engineers, and I want to try to get rid of that opinion, is uh, consulting. If you're not part of the solution, there's good money to be made in prolonging the problem, right? That's what your opinion of an engineer is. Like, oh boy, we're going to get this guy involved to look at a, a structural um, situation that I have or a footing and he's going to dig up problems and then we're going to have even more problems. We don't want that to be the case. We want to come alongside you and minimize your business liability. So now let's look a little bit more uh, specific at what is included in an electrical design package. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is most people have a little bit of an understanding of what's involved in a structural design um, or a mechanical design or a, or a material handling design. So they know kind of where their limitations are. I've, I've got a complicated slip form. I'm not a structural expert. I'm going to hire a structural engineer. Or I've got a I want to move this many bushels from here to here. I don't know all the calculations. I'm going to hire a process or a, me or a mechanical engineer. But when it comes to electrical, for whatever reason, I find that it's, it's kind of a mystery, and it's kind of like the white elf in the room, and people are like, oh, just don't even talk about it. Hopefully, it'll all get hooked up and run at the end. Electrical is one of those things that, if you do it correctly, it'll go unnoticed at the end of the project, right? I always tell people if you do a lighting design correctly, you don't notice the lights. I mean, how, how many people have looked up and looked at the lights in this room? Probably a few, but, but if it's done correctly, it goes unnoticed. It's in the background, but if it's done incorrectly, it's a big, big problem. So in your electrical design package, I've got a list here of things that you as owners could put in your RFP to, to the electrical engineering company or electrical contractor, things that need to be in the package. Grounding and underground drawings, area classification drawings, this is a big deal. Um, some electrical engineers might not stamp an area classification drawing, but they'll help you put that drawing together. And we'll go into more detail on that in a little bit. Um, you want to have an electrical one-line diagram, power distribution, and layout drawings, lighting design, a motor and instrumentation schedule. You want to make sure that um, your power engineer is working with your controls engineer so that system is fully integrated. You want good electrical specifications, and then an arc flash and coordination study. And we'll get into some, 
specifics of all those. Um, this is a slide I throw in here. It's kind of, it's contract language, but it's very important. And in a court of law, these three phrases or three um, definitions have a lot of bearing. So when you're putting together contracts, um, you're using language like furnished by, I want the electrician to furnish this whatever. Furnished by has a specific definition that means a product is furnished to your site. So if you say, I want the electrician to furnish a light fixture package, they're going to furnish the lights, set them on your doorstep, and leave. Okay? If you say, I want um, the lights to be installed by the electrician, he's going to install a light fixture that you have furnished. If you want him to do the whole thing, you need to say, provided by. I want the electrician to furnish the material and install it. So that's provided by. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but it gets people tripped up a lot because your contractor probably knows the definition of those things. And he's just licking his chops when he sees installed or furnished and he knows that there might be a change order there. So try to limit that. Grounding drawings. Um, when you guys think about grounding, I think a lot, there's a lot of misunderstanding with grounding. We think of just a little copper wire going to a ground rod and the ground rod gets pounded in and whew, I'm done with grounding, okay? Grounding is very important, probably the most important thing um, for your electrical system. And there's three things that we're trying to accomplish with grounding. Number one is personnel protection. Um, when you look at a well-grounded system, you are not just worried about clearing a fault. So if I have a motor that has a short circuit, I want to trip the circuit breaker, that's okay. That's equipment protection. But when we do grounding on a facility, we want to make sure that the structural steel, so if this is a structural steel column, I want to make sure that is at the same voltage potential as a bucket elevator that I'm leaning up against, okay? If you think about a bucket elevator, you're moving grain with, a, with plastic and rubber material. What happens when you shuffle your feet across the carpet? You build up static, right? If I'm leaning against a steel column that's tied into the earth and I lean over and touch the bucket elevator, what's gonna happen? You discharge that electric static. Worst case, you have an explosion well, worst case, you might do real damage to this guy's heart, but you could have an explosion. So we're trying to put everything at the same voltage gradient. So we tie lots of things together. Um, this is a grounding detail that we're tying the rebar in your concrete footings up to the structural steel so that if I'm standing on the concrete, I'm at the same voltage gradient or potential as the column next to me, there's no difference in voltage. Go back one slide here. We're also looking at equipment protection. We talked about that. If, if you have a motor that has a winding failure, so a phase gets shorted to ground, we need to clear that fault, right, so we don't start a fire. And a third item with grounding is, and it's kind of a, re, it's kind of a byproduct of the other two, is lightning protection. Um, and there, if there's somebody that sells lightning protection in the room, just bear with me. I'm not saying we don't need lightning protection, but some of your facilities, um, you can't, A, you can't afford lightning protection, or you're not in an area of the country that really demands it based on the presence of lightning. But if your grounding is done correctly, if you've tied your bucket elevators down into the earth with your grounding system, you can take a lightning strike and you're gonna take that lightning right to the earth where it wants to go. If you're not tied into the earth correctly, where's the lightning strike gonna go? Down the tower, it's gonna to find the motors, it's gonna blow up the windings in the motors, then it's gonna to head to your switchboard, blow your switchboard up, right? So a byproduct of doing good grounding is some lightning protection. Moving along here, um, area classification. I've been in uh, 
classes on area classification that last a whole day, and this stuff is dry. I mean, it's boring. It's blah, heavy stuff. So I'm just going to hit the highlights of it and keep it light. And at, at an owner's level or a general manager's level, these are kind of the buzzwords that you need to be thinking about. And then for the details, hire a professional to dig into it. But in a dust area, we're talking about uh, class two area. The code also goes into some zones and different things, but that's not used a lot in the US, so I don't normally talk about that. But dust is a class two area. And generally speaking, again, don't pin me down on the details, but generally speaking, Inside a grain bin or inside your slip form, inside a holding tank, that's a class two dust, div one, which means there's dust suspended in the air. So when you look at your, you're in a grain bin while you're loading it, which you shouldn't be by the way, but if you were, there'd be dust suspended in the air. That's a class two div one. Class two div two is areas around that. So let's say you have a, a uh, belt conveyor, an enclosed belt conveyor, or drag conveyor. It's sealed. Inside the conveyor is a class two div one. The area right on the outside of it is a class two div two. Div two implies there could be dust in that area if I have a, uh, my seal breaks down on my conveyor or my dust collection system dies and now I've got dust in that area. That's a class two div two. And need to be aware of the dust in the air, but also layering of dust. So, two, again, I'm a, I'm, I am not a very in-depth, smart engineer. I'm just a picture guy. The picture there, inside a grain bin, right? The dust is floating in the air. That's class two, div one. Here we got a really nice receiving system, minimal dust. There's most likely dust collection on that pit so you're sucking the dust right into the grain flow. That's a class two div two, because if the dust collection system stops, the dust is gonna come out of that and suspend in air, and then we've created a uh, div one area. This, this is how I break it down. When you look at a piece of firewood in before you split it or before you grind it up into sawdust, if I lay a piece of firewood on the stage here, there's not a risk of an explosion, right? You would have to put paper under it or soak it down in lighter fluid, then you could have a campfire. If you grind that log up, so in other words, this is, this is corn in its kernel form. The dust though on the corn, or when you grind this log into sawdust, that sawdust burns a lot easier because now there's lots of surface area, okay? All of a sudden you've taken minimal surface area and you've created all kinds of surface area. So this is like an unclassified situation. Now we're moving into a class two, div two. Now if you were to have an open flame down here or an ignition source inside your plant and you blow that dust into the air, and we did this in high school science class and it's awesome. You blow that dust pile into the air over a flame and poof, right? So that's kind of the, 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 uh, the migration from determining yourself. I've got corn here, but there's no dust really involved. I've got a pile of dust here that could become suspended. Now I've got an explosive situation, so. Area classification drawings, so inside your electrical design package, you want your engineer to provide a drawing that tells the contractor what, what's classified. Inside the bins, class, class two, div one, the areas around the bins, maybe your reclaim tunnel, your receiving tunnels, class two, div two. But make them have that drawing in your drawing package. <coughs> Electrical one-line diagrams, so this is another component of your electrical design, and this is a diagram that essentially um, shows the entire electrical system from the utility service point into your main switchboard or distribution, down to your motor control center, 
over to your distribution panels. And if you just leave that up to the contractor, which there's a lot of very talented contractors, so don't, and I know there's contractors in the room, so don't get me wrong, they're capable of this also, but they're doing it on the fly in a sense, right? They're designing it as it's being built. Get the design professionals involved early and get this stuff done for you. Just a picture of a one-line diagram identifying key pieces there. Um, the amperage, voltage, phase, uh, the configuration. The other nice thing about doing the design up front is when you order that equipment, your contractor is going to get shop drawings. He can review it, make sure that the equipment matches the spec so it doesn't get shipped to the site and you got an, uh, an oh shit situation if it's wrong, right? The other thing, um, and, and, and so much of this is basic. When I explain it to you guys, you go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's not complicated, but it just takes, takes time to think it through. Power distribution layout drawings. Um, how many guys have got a grain elevator or a facility and the electrical service is in the broom closet? Nobody, right? There's a guy there that's brave enough to admit it. Older facilities especially, it's like the electrical service room was an afterthought. Just shove it in the broom closet. Just make sure it doesn't interfere with me getting the broom. Like that's how little importance it is. The, the, these facilities are getting larger and larger and your service equipment is getting bigger and bigger. And to really lay out that room correctly with the code required clearances um, is a big deal. Not just to meet code, but for the safety of your personnel so they can work on it. Lighting design, um, not going to spend a ton of time on this, but lighting is important. And there's a lot of, um, yesterday somebody brought up, you know, the rebates that are available for LED lighting or high output fluorescent lighting. A lot of the old uh, grain tunnels have incandescent lighting in them, right? And the, the lights vibrate when you're running your equipment and then when you actually have to go down there to maintain something, the lights are all burned out. A lot of the newer technology, the LED especially, it's great in tunnels because it's there, you don't have to service it, it comes on, you get a rebate from your utility company. Um, you guys have all seen this stuff, but this is kind of your traditional high output um, high energy, high uh, intensity discharge like metal halide. There's some really neat um, high output fluorescent products and LED of course is making a big move in the market. Arc flash and a coordination study. Um, how many people have heard of arc flash hazard? Right, everybody. Who would like to come up here and explain what it is? Duh! Right? It's, it's a buzzword in the industry. Everybody knows it's an issue. Everybody knows that OSHA's, it's on the top of their checklist to make sure you have an arc flash study. But nobody understands what it is. So I wanna, I wanna explain it. There's kind of three pieces to an arc flash hazard. And actually I'm gonna jump ahead a slide to describe it. If you think about a, a a uh, storage bin full of corn, okay? And you've got a side tap discharge on there. When you open the gate to that side tap, there's a nice flow of grain coming out of your bin, right? It's controlled. When the truck is full, you shut it off. That's similar to when I start a motor on my electrical system, turn the switch on, you have current flow to that motor. It's very controlled. The motor has a certain full load amps that it's gonna draw, and when you're done, you shut it off. You shut the gate, if you will, okay? And, and hopefully not all of you have experienced this, but some of you have. What happens if you took a torch or a grinder and ripped a seam below that, like this? All that stored energy in that pile of grain, is it, gonna still, is it still gonna look for that gate and stream out slowly? No. It's going to explode. It's going to explode out that opening in the bin, and you're going to have a big pile of corn. The guy that was standing there is going to have serious injury, if not be killed, okay? 
arc flash hazard is just like that. You have a, you have a utility with a 500 megawatt power plant. That's your stored energy, if you will, like the grain in the bin. And it's waiting to dump all that energy into a fault on your system. So somebody um, inadvertently drops their wrench across a bus bar in your switchboard. You've just shorted out your system and that entire energy that's at the utility level is gonna flood that. That's fault current. You might have 30,000 amps coming towards that fault. The guy that's standing there is like the guy standing in this situation here where the grain comes at him. That's gonna create a blast. The copper is going to melt, become suspended, blow out towards him. The length of time that that fault current flows is also goes into an arc flash calculation, right? The longer the guy stands there, the longer that that utility tries to feed that fault, the bigger fireball that exists. So the magnitude of the, of the fault current, the length of time is a big part. And then depending how close you are standing to the hazard, right? If you are standing right there, that's a big problem. But if you were in your pickup 100 feet away, it's not a big deal. So if we go back to the previous slide, arc flash hazard, you have to make sure you're aware of the magnitude of the fault current, the length of time that it exists, and the working distance from the fault. And then let your engineer or whoever else take care of it. But know that it's a real hazard. It's not just magic. It's not foo-foo dust. It's real. So hopefully the idea of that grain bin exploding kind of helps you relate to that. Um, coordination study. This is something that usually gets overlooked until you have the situation where you're trying to start a bucket elevator, let's say a 100 horsepower motor, and the 3,000 amp main on your switchboard trips. And instantly you're like, oh man, we got a big, we got an issue here. Well, it's a coordination problem. Um, I gotta find the right picture here. No, that's way at the end, my bad. Coordination simply means that you're, you're um, setting the circuit breakers upstream differently than the downstream circuit breaker. So that if you have a, a fault way down at a motor, you want to isolate that fault right to that motor. And you're not going to trip out your main and take, off your whole, take your whole plant offline. Okay? It costs money to do a coordination study, but it also costs money to shut your plant down. Right? So arc flash and coordination study, just buzzwords for you guys to, to go out and get um, pricing on. There's some techniques for mitigating arc flash. Um, you can always work on your equipment de-energized. So if, if you guys have an electrician come in, he says, well, you don't have an arc flash study done. I'm not, I'm not touching it. You can always take the time, shut your process down, and work on the equipment. Um, you can isolate the dangerous components of your electrical system. The main service entrance that's immediately after the transformer is the most dangerous. The motor control center or the motor starters where your guys are hitting the reset buttons and they're testing the fuses, and those aren't as dangerous. So put that in a different room so you don't run the risk of your local guy, your, your grain operator who's hitting a reset button getting injured at your main service. There's also uh, some products out there. They're very expensive, but in certain situations, you may have to use them. Again, reach out to an engineer. Um, you can put an arc fault in that cap basically captures the fault current and minimizes your arc flash. There's some relays you can do, stuff you can look into. What to expect from your contractor. So now we've kind of outlined what's all in the electrical package. Now we hand it off to our contractor. A um, couple things we need to look for from him, right? A defined scope of work. The panel talked about yesterday uh, bidding a $5 million whatever slip form project. You get a bid back from your contractor and it says $5 million. Pfft, dump it. They need to... What, what we like to see is all those pieces of the electrical design that I showed, 
have them assign a price to each one of those. Or your structural engineering, have them break all the pricing down because then you know he actually looked at the drawings. Make sure they got their licenses and certifications, right? Give a project schedule, good information flow, have them communicate with the engineer, participate in construction meetings, and then at the end of the project, make sure you get a set of as-built drawings. We know there's going to be changes from how we designed it, but don't just have them build it and not document that. Make them document it. Um, this is just kind of a funny slide, but this is kind of sometimes the, the theory, right? Let's have lots of meetings. None of us is as dumb as all of us, baby. Let's all get in a room and complicate the situation. Need to be um, getting inspections done during the project. One of the first things I do when I start on a project is reach out to the electrical inspector and the insurance company as a design professional because I want them to be involved from day one. A lot of owners go, oh my gosh, why are you talking to the electrical inspector? We don't want him on site. Don't call him, don't talk to him. Well, they will come on your site and it's way better to get them involved right up front than to wait and cross your fingers and hope he doesn't find anything at the end. Get them involved. Talk to your insurance company. Um, we talked about area classification. Insurance companies like to be involved in those decisions. They've got, most insurance companies have pretty strict guidelines on how they want to classify an area. Um, have your engineer on site once in a while or at a minimum send them um, pictures of your project, what's going on. And then get your safety team involved. Last thing is commissioning. And this, we talked about this a little bit with arc flash and coordination. You can do all the design correctly. You can build it correctly. But then at the end, you need to commission it and actually see if it works. On the circuit breakers, um, we got circuit breakers with settings. Make sure your engineer gives you those settings and make sure your contractor puts them into the circuit breakers. On your control systems, right, you guys have very sophisticated control systems. We got plug switches, speed switches, Hasmon devices. Test those devices. Have your contractor go trip a plug switch and show you on the PLC screen that, yep, that plug switch for that conveyor trip, the conveyor shut off. Don't just assume it all works. Go put a, go put a heat source under a bearing temperature switch and make sure that the PLC shuts the equipment down and that you see that alarm. I'm gonna back up here. This would obviously be a nice installation. This guy heard there was a commissioning team coming, so he duct taped the sensor in there, and this should be fine. We're gonna be good. This'll pass. Well, it won't, right? <clears throat> and get your as-built drawings. You, if you went through all the work of hiring an engineer and you had it constructed, Make sure that contractor gives you as-built drawings that have notes on little changes they made or assumptions they made. This, <clears throat> this was a picture taken. Um, I was out on a site with another guy and we were in an area and we were chuckling because this is a class one, which is a vapor area, so like a gasoline vapor. Um, division one, explosion box. This electrician mounted right next to, actually he mounted this second, just a general purpose receptacle. And then there's a door opener here with just some Rolmex running up. So this guy was like, I don't know what the hell the code says. I'm going to put in a little bit of everything and just hope the inspector passes it, right? And then get your warning signs mounted or posted. All your safety stickers, make sure that's done. I love this sticker. It says, I got to read it off here. If you encounter a mountain lion, step one, face the lion and back away slowly. Step two, be large and shout at the lion if step one didn't work. Step three, keep your children really close and pick your kids up without the mountain lion noticing. That's important. And if all that fails, if you're attacked, make sure you fight back. That's all I got.